This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Blank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to thank everyone for uh, stopping by, if you will, and listening in. And I pray that today's a lesson or study rather would be a blessing to you. And I just ask and pray that you uh, that you would um, be blessed by it. And with that, let us go ahead and open up with a word of prayer so we can begin our study for today. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that your blessings might be upon this Bible study ministry. I pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that your blessings might be upon all who would hear this message. I pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that the Holy Spirit would now take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, we are going to get started, brothers and sisters. Again, the mission of the inspirational Bible study ministry is to lead men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus the Christ through the study and the teaching of the Word of God. That is our principle, that is our mission, and I pray that the truth of that mission may be seen in the Word of God as it is taught and studied uh, this day. Our, our scripture will be coming from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13. Our title is Freedom to Love. Freedom to Love. And our key verse comes from Romans, cha Romans chapter 13, verse 9. It reads, The commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's so true, brothers and sisters. Our study next week will be coming from the Epistle to the Colossians, Chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, freedom from the world. Now, that's going to be a very, very interesting study, brothers and sisters. I pray that you may uh, be able to hear it and be blessed by it. We are going to go into our uh, historical background. Last week's study ended, ended at the Jerusalem Council, where the apostles and disciples had come together and determined that Faith alone was necessary to become a member of God's family, and that following the law was not necessary for salvation. Peter spoke, followed by Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, and then the leader of the council, James, spoke last and gave his decision on the matter. James had announced in Acts chapter 15, verses 19 through 20, saying this, Therefore I judge that you should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood, that is the eating of blood. A letter was written for Paul and company to take back to Antioch, confirming the council's decision informing Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, with these words. Since we have heard that some who went out from us, he's talking about the Judaizers, <clears throat> have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such a commandment. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, he says, to lay upon you no greater burden. The matter had been settled once and for all, brothers and sisters. The authoritative decision given by the apostles in Jerusalem was needed. Otherwise, there would have been a division in the church. 
Now, as for those who read the letter, they rejoiced for his encouraging message, according to the scriptures. Unfortunately, this exists today among certain religions, even though the matter was settled over 1900 years ago. Some today are still trying to persuade individuals that they must follow a law or the law or a different so-called gospel claiming that it comes from Christ. Many will have to answer to God for deceiving souls and leading them to an eternal separation from our God and creator. At the Jerusalem Council, the apostles understood based on the testimony of Peter that God does not show favoritism, but accepts every nation and accepts from every nation, it says, the one who fears him and does what is right, according to Acts chapter 10, verses 34, and 35, and that the promise to Abraham, he says, would be fulfilled, that promise that we find in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. The believing Jews had been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same gift was also given to believing Gentiles of all nations through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, just as it was preached to the Jews that they too would be given the gift of the Holy Spirit, just as those first 120 Jewish disciples were given the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And don't miss this. Just as the Jews' hearts were changed, evidence of the Gentiles' hearts being changed was witnessed by Peter after they heard and believed the gospel that he preached. The Holy Spirit came upon them in the house of Cornelius. And we find that in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, it tells us that while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. The presence of God's Spirit on the Gentiles showed their being grafted into the olive tree the family of God, and the church, which is the spiritual body of Christ Jesus. But what is most important is that every believer has this testimony dwelling within them. Their lives, our lives, were changed because we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As the scripture says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and, and in their minds. I will write them according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. And this is further evidence, further proof of Christ's resurrection and ascension and the promise fulfilled that the Father will send the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit does not dwell within the individuals, then Christ is not raised. We are living testimonies, brothers and sisters, that our Savior lives. No other so-called religion or cult has this testimony. This is why prophets of old and true believers throughout the ages were willing to endure persecution and even death for Christ's sake, because the promises of God are true, friends. If the promise of the Holy Spirit is true, and we are living testimonies of that, then the promise of eternal life is also true. We endure because we believe and have been changed and we desire eternal life, a life that is forever in the presence of the Lord. 
We believed, brothers and sisters, and the results of our belief is the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the guarantor, if you will, until the day that we are redeemed and caught up to be with the Lord. As the scriptures write concerning the faithful of old, that these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were what? Strangers and pilgrims on the earth. True believers in Christ Jesus can make that same claim. We are but strangers in a strange land, pilgrims on the earth. And for now, entrance into the presence of God comes through the departure of the body. Proof that the law had nothing to do with salvation was witnessed at Pentecost. It was witnessed at Cornelius' home. And what Peter says is true. Why would they, or the Jews, the Judaizers, test God as if God's gift of the Holy Spirit we found in Acts chapter 11, verses 15 and through 17, was some sort of mistake. Our study takes us from a doctrinal focus to a more practical focus, where Paul shifts his thinking, his thinking by challenging his readers to offer themselves as living sacrifice that is spoken of in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The greatest evidence, brothers and sisters, the greatest evidence of this is seen when the Savior went to the cross. The greatest evidence of self-sacrifice was when Jesus went to the cross, who also said this in John chapter 6, verse 15, 51, rather. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, now that tells me right now, right then, that that's not Joseph's boy. Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. That's why he went to the cross. Greater love has no one than this, Jesus says than to lay down one's life for his friends, demonstrating the greatness of love. We find in Mark chapter 12, verse 31, it announces that the second commandment is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This takes us to our study for this morning. And so we find in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Paul says this, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now sandwiched between his, comment, his comments concerning submitting to government rules and regulations and putting on Christ, Paul reminds the believers in Rome and he reminds us, brothers and sisters, that while social duties, dues, and debts should be paid, there is one debt that will always remain, the debt of loving one another in perpetuity. In other words, brothers and sisters, Paul is saying that believers in Christ Jesus are indebted to love one another permanently, permanently. A debt will never, that will never, uh, it says here, a debt we will never get out of and should have no desire to get out of. Paul's main point is not the prohibition of taking out loans. That was not his main point. But rather the debt of love that is never paid off. Now we find in Romans chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, Paul goes on to say this, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, 
namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Only the King James Version and the New King James Version add the phrase, you shall not bear false witness. So when Jesus counseled the rich young ruler, he said to him this, he says, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your mother and your father. According to Mark chapter 10, verse 19, when asked by the scribe, what was the greatest command? He probably, the scribe probably expected Jesus to recite one of the 10 commandments. But the Lord surprised him by adding a caveat. He said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. But Jesus didn't stop there, friends. He was careful to say, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these, Jesus says. And we find in Matthew chapter 2, chapter 22, verse 40, it goes on to say that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Of the commandments spoken of by Christ Jesus and then by Paul, all but four of the commandments are mentioned. And there is a reason for this, brothers and sisters. As mentioned in earlier studies, God's divine moral law divine moral law was extended from the mind of God to mankind written on tables of stone. But the essence of these commandments is are centered on God's love. The essence of these commandments is, sentence, is centered on God's love, which is that perfection of the divine nature by which God is eternally moved to communicate himself. And, the case, uh, and in the case of Israel and mankind, by the giving of the law, that was how it was communicated. That was how it was communicated. And so the love of God is expressed in the commandments, and in particular, the ones that affect the emotional and social well-being of men and women. In other words, love delights in the happiness of its objects, our neighbor, for example, our friend, our enemy, etc. Love prevents us from injuring those we love, be it emotionally, physically, economically or religiously and leads us to fulfill all that the law requires through Jesus Christ, through Christ alone. This is how we fulfill the law. It is not by the letter, it is by faith in Christ Jesus. In fact, friends, the law required nothing that was not conducive to the best uh, to the best of our interests the treatment of others as we would like to be treated is a demonstration of the law of love and in particular certain commandments that affect us personally would you want someone to steal from you for example no then the scripture says, then love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't want someone to steal from you, don't steal from them. Would you want someone to have an affair with your husband or wife? No. Would you want someone to harm a member of your family? No, etc., etc. So the answer of course, of course to all of these is no. 
This is why Christ said, and then Paul preached, that loving your neighbor is the fulfillment of the law, which refers to the treatment of one's neighbor, which demonstrates our love for God by being obedient to his moral standards and, com and commandments. Jesus says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. It is love demonstrated by doing and not necessarily by feeling that Jesus made this comment. And so we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, Paul says, love never fails. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Love, brothers and sisters, is an attribute of the Almighty. But the scriptures write that God is love, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And if God is love, and God is eternal, then it stands to reason that love is, love is eternal. And this is why love will never fail. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even long after the earthbound qualities of the church, such as knowledge, uh, gifts, uh, prophecies, even long after those earthbound qualities have ceased to exist, love will continue eternally. The contrast, however, whether it was an issue in the Corinthian church or not, was that all other qualities of the church, such as prophecies and tongues and knowledge, are but, uh, but temporary. They are all temporary, brothers and sisters. And there was a reason for them, and that is the building up of the church. This is critical. This is key. The reason why we have these gifts today is for the building up of the church, which is the body of Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. With the Savior's return, when our Lord and Savior returns, the end of the church age begins. The end of it. Spiritual gifts that were used for edifying and building up the church will cease because Christ will return to take his church back with him. We see the first proof of this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 40, 43, when Jesus spoke to the repentant thief on the cross. He said to him this, Assuredly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. That's what he said to the repentant sinner who was hanging on the cross. That sinner was not going to come down from that cross. He was going to die. But Jesus assured him because of his, excuse me, repentant heart, he would be with Christ in paradise. That means two things, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Christ was going to be in paradise and that sinner was going to be in paradise, that repentant sinner. But the assurance that all true believers in Christ Jesus will be in paradise as well is written in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, <clears throat> verse 24. As our Lord prayed, he said this, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am and that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. And please don't miss this, friends. Jesus said of those who will be with him in glory that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
they follow me. So wherever Christ is, we will follow Christ. And the assurance of eternal life is promised to those of us who follow Christ. The assurance of eternal life, it says to this, it says this, no matter the circumstance, be it health issues, attacks from the devil, or even death, none of these can prevent the believer from entering into the paradise of God. None. This is the promise of the Savior. And Jesus puts the final seal of his testimony by saying this, my father who has given them to me, he says, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. This is how we know that the true believer, no matter how many, how many times he or she may fall, shall never lose their salvation. Not even man's last enemy, which is death, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, not even death can snatch God's people from God's hands. Not even death. All these things are true, brothers and sisters, because of the power of God's love for mankind, which will never cease, even after we are taken to be with the Lord. In verses 9 and 10, Paul writes this. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away, <clears throat> done away. The church age began at Pentecost. We have to understand this. The church age will end when Christ returns. The building up of the church was through the work of the Holy Spirit. So from the time of Pentecost until the time that our Savior returns, the work and the activities of the Holy Spirit will remain. It was first given to them, the Holy Spirit, to the 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost. But in order to do this, the Holy Spirit gave spiritual gifts to believers as he saw fit to give them. So in order to do what? In order for the church to be built up, believers had to be given gifts. And those gifts were given to them and us through the Holy Spirit. We find these gifts are listed in First uh, Corinthians chapter 12 and in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, such gifts as apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers. But for what purpose were they given, friends? They were given for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry for doing what? For the edifying of the body of Christ, which is the church. They were given so that the church would be would continue to grow and expand throughout the world starting at Pentecost until our Lord returns. Our Lord confirms this when he said in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then he says, and then will the end come. In other words, when the gospel has permeated the world, Christ will return. The end will come. Things will continue until our Lord returns. All that we do is in part until perfection comes. Knowing in part or prophesying in part will continue until the Lord returns in the air to take the saints of God back with him. This is called, in uh, biblical vernacular, the rapture. 
though the word itself is not mentioned. But I encourage you to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Biblical truths and prophecy must come to pass, brothers and sisters. It must come to pass until perfection comes. When Christ returns and the church age comes to an end, what we see happening in the world today and in the future has a special meaning for true believers. It is a trial of our faith. It is a trial of our faith. So don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. The work behind what you see today is Satan. It's not the Lord. In fact, the enemy is counting on many of us, on many, to blame God for what is happening in the world today. That's what the enemy is counting on, is to blame God for what's happening in the world today. And so remember the words of Jesus. Remember the words of Jesus. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Remember the warnings Christ gave the saints, saying this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, he says, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Christ is saying that believers will experience anguish, burden, persecution, tribulations, and troubles. He already tells us that. There's nothing in the scripture that, that says, that Christ says, that when a person becomes a believer, that everything is going to be just peace and joy. On the contrary, we know the word of God. It says just the opposite. So now, if you've already been told, as I have told you this morning, do not act surprised of when you see the events of the day happening. Just know that that time is coming and Christ comes when the end of that time, the end of the things that are happening today comes to a head. What I mean by that is this. Imagine a woman going through, con uh, going through contractions. And as that child is being closer, to getting closer and closer to being born, those contractions are more painful, more painful, 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 until that child is born. But guess what? When that child is born, all that mother wants to see is her child. She has forgotten all about all that pain and anguish. That's the way the world is going. It has to be that way. And it's going to get worse until the return of Christ. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, Paul says. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Paul again compares that which is partial to that which is complete. As a child, he had partial knowledge limited to, the, uh, to that of a child. But when he matured, that which was partial was made full. Mirrors of Paul's day were nothing like mirrors today. Back then, an individual's face was dimly seen and out of focus. He contrasts it with our quote unquote dim knowledge of spiritual things. But he says, when Christ returns, the partial and the dim will all be done away and everything will come into focus. Everything will come into focus. First John chapter three, verse two writes, beloved, now are we children of God, and it has not been revealed 
what we shall be, he says, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And lastly, I was, verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these, Paul says, is love. Spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, come and go and will eventually no longer be needed. From an earthly perspective, faith, hope, and love, on the other hand, will remain even at the coming of the Lord. These three are indissolvable or indissolubly united virtues. But it is love that is at the root of the first two, faith and hope. When it comes to faith, love believes all things pertaining to Christ and the scriptures. When it comes to hope, love hopes for all things. Faith and hope are purely human aspects. But love, on the other hand, is divine and is an attribute of our creator, for God is love. Although faith and hope drives the believer to Christ, the outgrowth, the, the, uh, the exemplification of our spiritual maturity is found in love. As believers in Christ Jesus, we must understand how very important Paul's words are. He is right, brothers and sisters, when he says that the greatest of these is love. It was love and not, and, and not faith and hope that moved the eternal father of light to send the only begotten son into a darkened world. It was love, not faith and hope, but love that did this. In the person of Christ Jesus, God came into a dark world. He came down from the throne to bring light into a darkened world for the sole purpose of redeeming those who would believe the good news he brought to mankind. It was love, brothers and sisters, that led the Savior to the cross and gave his life for the world. And it will be love because it will be because of love that Christ, our Redeemer, will one day return and take back what is rightfully his. If a brother or sister departs this world before Christ returns, it will be God's love and promise that he or she will stand in the presence of the Lord, being absent from the body until we receive our new and glorious body. To those who do not love, does not know God, for God is love. That is the scriptures. And finally, brothers and sisters, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in that individual. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we know that you have loved us from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. You sent your Son into this world, Father, to give this world light because the world was in darkness, spiritual darkness. All who would believe on you will come out of that darkness and come into the marvelous light that you have brought to this world. I pray that those who have heard these words are in the light as you are the light. And I pray that those who will hear these words who do not know Christ as Savior may come to the Lord, receive him, believe him, 
and be forgiven of their sins. I pray this, O Heavenly Father, in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. That ends our study for today, brothers and sisters. I pray that you are blessed and have been blessed by these words. And I pray that we will meet again next Sunday. Have a blessed and wonderful day, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Amen.